come to a discussion on uh, upper GI bleeding and uh, of course the management of upper GI bleeding I'll be doing in uh, four uh, discussions and this will be the first of the discussions and uh, what is the definition of upper GI bleed and uh, to distinguish from a lower GI bleed now the, all the bleeds coming from the esophagus and the duodenum up to the DJ flexure are called as upper GI bleeds anything beyond the DJ flexure or beyond the ligament of traits are all grouped as lower GI bleeding very likely that this uh, definition has come that this part uh, is accessible by the upper GI endoscopes probably the reason but anyway just uh, remember that anything up to the ligament of traits we consider as upper GI bleed and uh, we'll be concentrating uh, on this so uh, take a piece of uh, paper and a pen and write if there is a bleeding from the upper GI of course the esophagus the stomach or the the duodenum how can a uh, upper GI bleed present what are, what are the clinical presentations there are four may, may, ways they can present and just pause the video and uh, write them up and just compare com compare your background knowledge or application knowledge that you have so one form is they can come with hematemesis or they can come with melina and often even the people who present with melina as uh, metamesis later they will have they may complain of that uh, of melina because the uh, collected blood will be going out but some cases of a GI bleed without a hematemesis they can present with a melina then also if the bleeding is at a slower rate they can uh, present with Occult blood loss and they will present with symptoms of anemia. Not a, a large proportion, but some few cases they can in fact present as a bleeding PR, but it is an acute severe bleeding PR. Now, when we call bleeding per rectum, it usually means when the person goes to the toilet, he has some bright red blood coming with the stool. But what is meant by acute severe bleeding PR is it's an acute onset and the person continues to bleed it is not that he goes to defecate and bleeds with the stool but there's no stool it's just blood pouring it's a severe form of bleeding per rectum so if an upper GI bleeder is bleeding very profusely very fast the blood transits to the gut very fast even before it changes the color they can present as a, uh, a bleeding PR and in that case it will be a severe one so these are the ways that a upper GI bleed can present so we will con today's discussion we will concentrate on the first presentation that is presenting with hematemesis so look at this uh, presentation which is uh, you know, was something that you very commonly see somebody coming to the emergency with hematemesis and also this says that he is restless so it's very likely that he has a significant significant amount of bleed so now what are you going to do what is your management of this patient so again pause the video and list list the things that you are going to do and compare with this uh, and so because if it's a hematemesis he, he may have bled a lot so it's very important that first you do your airway breathing circulation and resuscitate very likely the air will be all right but he may be tachypneic because of the hypotension therefore he needs oxygen and then of course assess the circulation and need start on resuscitation first to start with saline but if he has lost a lot of blood uh, the blood pressure not coming up the person will need blood transfusion and then once the patient is stable and also monitoring has to continue and a quick history and examination to find the possible cause and of course it's not necessary to waste a lot of time but it's important and just list what are the possible causes so you take a appropriate history and do an examination so again pause the video 
be better to have this interaction and then check your background knowledge whether you can treat a person like this and uh, so list the causes and have compare whether you have got this maybe you have got more than this and the common causes are esophageal varices peptic ulcer bleeds and malignant ulcers can bleed uh, and malary vice syndrome and a rupture aortic aneurysm and vascular malformations so when you think of malignant ulcer it's more common for a gastric ulcer to have uh, hematemesis more than esophageal but esophageal also can be then have a hematemesis and the aortic enteric fistula the thoracic aneurysm may rupture to the esophagus or uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm can rupture the duodenum causing a uh, aortic duodenal fistula so quick history now the person may be having already diagnosed varices or he may be an alcoholic and have a lot of features of liver insufficiency like distension of abdomen due to ascites uh, uh, and on examination of course you may see features of uh, uh, liver involvement of cirrhosis like uh, even he may be in a uh, liver failure and of course things like uh, parotid swellings, gynecomastia, uh, the evidence of protocaval uh, shunts like a quick medusa, edema, uh, it depends on the degree of the cirrhosis of peptic ulcer in the history you may have this classic history of dyspepsia and also you may be using NSAIDs and malignancy loss of appetite weight uh, and examination you may feel a mass of tracheal lymph nodes low BMI and this uh, of course initially the person has uh, severe vomiting with I mean uh, vomiting with a lot of retching and then the bleed comes and aortic aortic enteric fistula again the person may may be a person who's already diagnosed with their aneurysm who was on observation or had uh, some uh, symptoms of uh, dyspeptic symptoms and uh, of course they have severe form of bleeding and uh, uh, there's a high chance that uh, the person may have uh, these people have a significant mortality risk also but they have severe forms of bleeding and the vascular malformations and then of course a quick history of your medical and because for the management of the total patient they may be important and also maybe the person is on NSAIDs and the social history but you don't wait waste a lot of time it's a quick history and examination if you're a trained clinician this can be just done in just five minutes while the person is being resuscitated so uh, then of course he needs an early endoscopy it depends on the condition if it's a mild bleed patient stable of course you, it may be not necessary to do any emergency in the night or something but of course it's uh, early endoscopy is necessary but if the patient is unstable uh, severe bleeds you have to do a very urgent endoscopy and it will tell you the exact diagnosis supposing you do the endoscopy and you find esophageal varices then what is your management so you see esophageal varices what is your management again pause the video without looking i can you know, without looking at the what you see in the background just list down what the things you are going to do uh, so pause the video and have a look so of course uh, you have your medical treatment so if you suspect varices in your history and examination uh, you may start on your medical management with the Pesoprisino octreotide infusion and then intervention. So, how are you going to stop the bleeding? So, at the with the endoscopy itself, your first line treatment is one of these you can do the banding or sclerotherapy for esophageal varices. And if there are gastric varices, you apply you can apply glue. So, out of banding and sclerotherapy, banding is is better if you have the facility, better do banding. So, esophagus, you do banding. If it's uh, stomach varices, spinal varices, there, you apply glue. And then, if the patient settle down, if the patient settle down, fine. Of course, you can observe for one or two days and discharge the patient and you discharge on a beta blocker if there's no contraindication because by reducing the portal uh, pressure, the further bleeds will be less. And then, of course, you can follow up with the repeat imaging. And if there are any re residual varices, you can ban them also and then continue on your medical management. So, that is if your banding becomes successful. 
if it's a failure, you, you fail to ban if a severe bleeding or you ban and still the person is bleeding, then of course if it's available uh, is to, in case of failure, so you arrange for tamponade using a uh, second break more tube. And uh, so this uh, compression, how long can you keep? Because if you keep too long, a complication that can happen is esophageal wall necrosis and esophagus can perforate. So uh, you the, the duration maximum, you keep it for about 24 hours. You're not going to go beyond. But even during the 24 hours, like every three years, better to deflate the balloons. There are two balloons to inflate. One thing, a long tubular one for the esophagus and a, another one for the stomach. You would uh, inflate the both balloons. Once the, it's, you replace it uh, properly, and then uh, uh, it's a vagal balloon and the stomach balloon, uh, you descend and pull up. So the, the stomach balloon helps to uh, compress on the fundal varices, and also there's another channel uh, to aspirate the stomach contents. So with uh, this uh, tamponade, if it's successful, what I will do, the bleeding stop. This is only a temporary measure. So if, it, if the bleeding stop, of course, you have to do a repeat endoscopy and do banding and then discharge on your propranolol and further follow up endoscopy and necessary banding. So, uh, but we have to, it's important to understand that this is a temporary measure. So, if the bleeding stops, you are not going to discharge the patient because it would have been a severe bleed uh, that we could control with banding at the beginning and therefore, you, if it's successful, you band and then only you discharge. But if the tamponade is also failed, then of course you have to uh, do some form of uh, arrange for some form of uh, shunting, a porta systemic shunt to decompress the uh, the uh, naturally occurring shunts. So when you do a artificial shunt for, to take the blood from the portal system to the systemic without going through the liver so your naturally start uh, occurred sh shunts will close up and the bleeding will stop and the best way is of course endovascular if it is available this is called TIPS procedure this uh, transjugular intrahepatic porta systemic shunt but if it is not available of course it's to do a open surgery and make a porta systemic shunt but of course uh, uh, it has a significant mortality and morbidity and anyway even if you do tips of course there's a chance that the patient may go into a hepatic encephalopathy after the procedure because you bypass the the blood the portal blood without going through the liver which provides the necessary detoxifications and you're pushing into the systemic circulation and also of course after creation of shunt even if the person has ascites it also may improve so just to summarize what we have uh, discussed so far, uh, upper GI bleeds are anything up to the ligament of traits and one form of uh, upper GI bleeding is presenting with a, with a hematemesis, coming with a hematemesis and then a quick resuscitation after assessment followed by a brief history and examination and then endoscopy will make the diagnosis and if it is a esophageal varices, you treat with banding. Uh, and then you discharge on propranolol and follow up endoscopy and majority will settle like that only the cases who fail that you will need tamponade and after tamponade again you band and discharge but if tamponade also fail then of course uh, you will have to resort to a porta systemic shunt so that is how you manage a hematemesis uh, one form of upper GI bleed and just for interest, we'll have a look at what is this banding, how it looks like. So before I start playing the video, hopefully it will play. And of course now this is a longitudinal section of the esophagus. And you can see this is the varix and this is the tip of the endoscope. And on the tip of the endoscope, this banding, uh, equipment is mounted so before you do the endoscopy you have to mount this uh, the, you can see the bands there are may, may, many bands so with one uh, endoscopy you can band many varices so you have to deploy these bands 
onto the barrack. So we'll just see how uh, how it's being done. So this is actually a longitudinal view. So what is the endoscopist will see is actually through the endoscope he will see the varix and we'll see uh, the appearance that one would get. <laughs>